This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, good morning. I'm Peter Wilson, a uh, faculty here at Emory Cardiology Division. And this morning we have a guest speaker. It's Scott Damrauer from Philadelphia. We're welcoming him uh, right after Veterans Day on a very cold uh, Monday morning here in Georgia. Uh, Scott and I have known each other for about six or seven years. We are both collaborators uh, and investigators in large VA databases. Uh, he was uh, been a Northeasterner for most of his career, uh, Harvard, Harvard Medical School, Boston training, and now faculty member at Penn. So Scott, come on up and tell us about your recent research and your, and your clinical, everything. Yeah, yeah. So great. Th thanks, Peter. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm going to be speaking today about precision cardiovascular medicine. You know, are, are we there yet? And I think probably in retrospect, um, I should have titled this more, where are we going rather than are we there yet? Because I think we all throw around the term precision medicine, and I'm never quite sure, and I mean, even me personally, like what it means, what I mean when I say it, and I think there's a lot of sloppiness around it. So what I'm hoping to do today is to show how we can use precision medicine for two things. One is risk prediction, and the other is informing therapeutic selection. These are my disclosures. None of them are really relevant to this, although I, I do have to say the non-listed disclosure is the fact that clinically I'm a vascular surgeon. Um, and so I'm a little wary of starting to talk about risk prediction and risk stratification at Cardiology Grand Round. So I'm gonna to try to stick to the stuff I know, which is the precision and the genetics end of it, unless the clinical management of, of, of cardiovascular disease. Anyways, I think this audience is probably very familiar with this algorithm here, which is the most recent AHA, ACC, kind of ASCVD risk stratification and management guidelines for primary prevention. And it all hinges on establishing the degree of 10-year uh, risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And then from there, really inter, uh, instituting intervention, which by and large, when we're talking about primary prevention is lipid lowering therapies. And over the years, we've done pretty well uh, with this. This is NHANES data presented in the most recent AHA stroke and uh, heart disease summary statistics. And you can see that kind of by uh, couple of year period, we've really dramatically reduced population levels of total cholesterol. And this, you know, has led to decreased rates of heart disease starting in the 80s and pretty consistently into 2010. Unfortunately, moving forward from 2010, the rates of death from CVD have, have started to increase again. And so the question becomes, do we need better risk prediction? And can we move to an era of precision risk prediction and then precision therapy based on that to try to reduce those trends? In order to understand where we're moving to, I think we need to understand where we're starting from. And this is an example of there's multiple ways to do it. And I just picked one, kind of the two main risk prediction algorithms we can deploy in the United States. We like to use the pooled cohorts equation, which was the kind of a AHA ACC. This is QRISC3, which is essentially the UK's version of the same thing. You can see based on the box on the left, it's a, a little more complicated and they added a whole bunch of extra stuff to try to get it to work better. Um, but I think the take home here is when you look at the R squared, we're only uh, explaining about 60% of the variance in the phenotype with this risk per al algorithm. So state of the art, we're only getting at 60%, which suggests that if we want to improve risk prediction, we have to find something new, more, better, different to capture the remainder portion of this risk. Um, and one of the things I think that has garnered a lot of attention is the use of genetics to do that. So this is a Manhattan plot. It happens to be from a GWAS we did on PAD, but that's, that's less important than just kind of illustrating how genetic risk works. So when we talk about incorporating genetic risk into risk prediction, we're not talking about the genetics of say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you know you carry a bag three mutation or you, you know, someone has an LMNA variant and ends up with monogenic heart failure. We're talking about these variants that confer relatively small risks. So among the leading risk loci for PAD is the LPA locus, which only increases your odds by about 26%. This dips down to things like this Cal4A1, 
which increases your odds by 5%. And then there's a whole bunch of risk that lies in this region where, you know, we can't say that there's a specific significant risk variant, but there certainly is, is conveyed a lot of genetic risk. And so what people have done is develop something called polygenic risk scores, which essentially sum the very small effects of these variants across the entire genome, adjusting for the fact that they aren't inherited independently, and then essentially make a score that fits a normal distribution. And from that, we look at what happens when you exist in the upper outlier of that score. And, you know, different people draw this line in different places, but it's a nice characterization between saying someone is at normal genetic risk or low genetic risk and someone is at high genetic risk. And this really took off in the CAD literature around 2018 from what was a very nice publication by Amit Kara and the group at the Broad in Nature Genetics, and then followed by some very similar work by Mike and Newey from Cambridge published in Jack. And what they showed that if you took this approach to CAD, those at the highest polygenic risk had the highest rates of prevalent, cor prevalent coronary artery disease. Um, here is kind of this dot plot. Uh, the Newey paper looks at it as risk quartiles and prevalence over age. But either way, a one standard deviation increase increased your odds of disease by about 60 to 70%. And if you were in this very, very top group, your risk of having disease was about fourfold compared to those um, not in the top group. And that's roughly equivalent to what you get for having familial hypercholesterolemia. So they tried to argue that this was a monogenic equivalent. This led to a whole industry of investigation of what the utility of these scores are. And I have to say, we, we definitely jumped in on that, on that endeavor. Um, I'm, as Peter said, I, I work at both Penn and the VA. And so one of the data sources I use is the Penn Medicine Biobank. We currently have, it's actually now probably closer to 100,000 individuals enrolled in the biobank from throughout the uh, Penn Medicine system. We have genetics currently in about 45,000. Uh, you know, our biobank is interesting because it's rather diverse with respect to race, uh, age, and gender, and is rather diverse with respect to health outcomes. And I think unlike the UK biobank actually has some legitimate disease in it. And so one of the first things we did was to ask what the additional value of polygenic risk was in the situation in which you knew the absolute most about someone's coronary status. And so this was work that was initiated by Mike Levin. Mike is a cardiology fellow and my research group was actually finishing this year and out on the job market looking for academic faculty jobs um, and is absolutely brilliant. So what we did is assemble a cohort of individuals at Penn who had undergone coronary catheterization. So arguably there is no more you can know about their risk. You know what their coronaries look like and you know everything about them clinically. And what we asked is does a polygenic risk score help us predict whether or not they're gonna die? And what we saw is that among all individuals, and this is about 1,500, undergoing coronary catheterization, being in the high PRS group, which is this blue line, was associated with about a 60% increased odds of, of death uh, moving forward. And this difference between the high PRS and the low PRS group with respect to survival persisted whether or not you had a clean cath, whether or not you had non-obstructive CAD, or whether or not you had obstructive CAD. So it didn't, you know, it wasn't that we were just picking out people with our PRS that had obstructive CAD. This difference was consistent across. And it, it got us thinking as others had that somehow we were capturing something orthogonal to traditional risk with the polygenic risk score. We went on to team up with Pradeep Natarajan at uh, Partners or really at MGH and with uh, Grish Nadkarni and Ron Doe at Mount Sinai and looked at this in a broader context across three large academic biobanks. One of the interesting things we saw is that a one standard deviation increase in polygenic risk was actually associated with about a uh, odds ratio of 1.4. Now, if you remember back to the initial slide I showed you, in both the initial UK biobank papers, they were seeing an odds ratio of about 1.67 or a hazards ratio of 1.7. Um, 
we're clearly seeing some moderation. Some of this is almost undoubtedly winner's curse. And then I think secondly, all of these biobanks have more racial and ethnic diversity than the original biobank, which was UK Biobank. And so some of this is the fact that these scores don't perform as well in non individuals of non-European ancestry. Either way, we, we went on and tried to ask how the high and low risk individuals based on polygenic risk score um, stacked up based on traditional risk factors. And so kind of shown two different ways, we're comparing those in the top 20% of PRS, so high risk, to those in the bottom 80% of PRS, so ostensibly low risk. And what you can see is whether or not you measure risk by the pooled cohorts equation, or whether you compare the recommendation for being on a statin using ACC AHA guidelines or US PSTF guidelines, it's almost identical across the high and the low risk groups. And so we know the high risk group is associated with more disease, but we see that our traditional ways of evaluating the risk are not capturing that. We've gone on to do some further work recently, really trying to dissect this, and this is unpublished data that Mike has done using some advanced genetic approaches called genetic structural equation modeling, and to kind of spare you an extremely long statistical genetics lecture. What this allows us to do is to take the genetics of different phenotypes that we know are risk factors for coronary artery disease and the genetics of coronary artery disease and ask how they're related and to calculate some of them while taking away others. And so the important numbers to pay attention to here are this 0.66. So if you take the genetics of coronary artery disease and you essentially either subtract out or control for the genetics of BMI, blood pressure, smoking, non-HDL cholesterol, and type two diabetes, you still have 66% of the genetics of coronary artery disease that you haven't accounted for. And so we call this the residual risk. So this is the genetics of CAD minus our traditional risk factors. When you do enrichment analyses, you start to see some interesting things. So this is pathway enrichment of coronary artery disease as a whole. And it should shock no one that almost everything on this list is cholesterol. So these are the top enriched pathways for the genetics of coronary artery disease, and it's essentially cholesterol. This is the top enriched pathways for the genetics of the residual risk to CAD once you take away the traditional risk factors and you don't see cholesterol anywhere on this list. What you end up seeing is some histamine signaling, some serotonin signaling, metal ion transport, blood vessel development. And, and, and so really suggesting that there are all of these biological processes that are driving coronary artery disease that we don't capture with our traditional risk. And I think most interestingly, building the case for using this for biological discovery and new drug development, but also again, providing more evidence that there is something special about genetic risk to CAD. And so that would lead you to think as, as I was probably a year and a half ago, that to be very bullish on the role of polygenic risk scores and their ability to differentiate risk and have some clinical utility. And then a couple of papers came out in JAMA that really caused me and I think everyone to reassess that scenario. So these are two analyses, one done using Eric and Mesa data um, by, by this group here, and another done using data from the UK Biobank. And they both use pretty sophisticated methods, including net reclassification index, and, shot and saw that in truth, the improvements by adding a polygenic risk score to kind of the best available clinically validated risk models was actually statistically significant, but only clinically marginal to null. That it really, at the end of the day, didn't matter. That you could do all of this and you didn't affect outcomes. And it led to this rather kind of sobering editorial by Sajid Khan, Richard Cooper, and Phil Greenland, arguing that kind of, in, in a certain sense, it was time to move beyond trying to incorporate this into clinical care and that it really wasn't gonna fulfill what we had all hoped. 
if that wasn't enough for you, this is some research that um, is yet unpublished that, uh, that comes from Peter Wilson here, along with Jason Vassey, looking at a similar question in the VA Million Veterans Program. So they took um, out of the MVP, which has about 900,000 enrollees, 650,000 with genetics, they identified a cohort of 137,000 veterans that were free of baseline CAD and had good follow-up data, and then compared the effects of using the pooled cohorts equation calibrated in the VA for veterans to that of using the pooled cohorts equation plus polygenic risk scores, and then measured the net reclassification index. And what you're seeing here plotted is in fact the net reclassification index. And you can see, yes, for at least whites and blacks, they did exclude the null hypothesis and there is some net reclassification. But if you look at the absolute amount of net reclassification, it's really unremarkable. And I think, you know, I would argue, and I know Peter agrees with me, that it's like so unremarkable to ask whether or not it's clinically useful at all. And it's probably not. Now, one of the interesting things I think about this is that if you come down here to those individuals less than 40 years old, you start to see some clinically meaningful reclassification. Now, granted, the sample size is small. It is the VA after all. And so the error bars are wide and you can't exclude the null. But I think you're starting to see a signal. And so it raises you know, the idea that, okay, maybe PRS is for clinical care in a 60-year-old who rolls into your office aren't the answer because we're actually pretty good at predicting the risk for that 60-year-old. But in the 40-year-old and those that are younger, maybe they do have something to offer. And so I think as I come back from those two JAMA papers and other work that we've done, also an MVP that shows very similar things to Peter, that one use of the PRS may be in the very young. And this is a, uh, a, a, a paper from a group, again, using UK Biobank data, in which they compared a clinical risk prediction score to a risk prediction score that included polygenic risk scores. And what they see is by age group, those in this 40 to 54 year old, so not even as young as Peter's young group, had about an NRI of 15. And NRI is one of these statistics that's hard to interpret. Um, it, in general ranges from zero to two. Um, on this scale, that would be zero to 200. But that you see kind of, there's a significant and a clinically meaningful reclassification in this group. Looked at another way, um, these are 10 year incident plots for CAD, cumulative incidents. The red plot is the uh, people who both the clinical tool and the integrated tool predicted to be high risk, and they clearly had the most CAD. And the green line is the group that both tools predicted to have low risk. But the purple are the individuals that the clinical tool predicted would have low risk, but the integrated tool with the genetics upclassified them and increased their risk. And the blue line is those that the clinical tool suggested would be high risk and the genetics downclassified to have low risk. So again, showing just kind of in a different way that the genetics can add something. But again, this is in that young group of 40 to 54 year olds. So I, I think suggesting that PRS may have a role in the young. There's another use for PRS, and I don't have a great slide to kind of demonstrate that it works this way, but I think intuitively it does. So if you go to the AHA, ACC risk classification algorithm again, and you focus in on this borderline risk group or this intermediate risk group, it's basically suggested that you should look at enhancers to try to decide whether or not you should start statins. And when you look at what the risk of enhancers are, they are things such as a family history of premature ASCVD, persistently elevated LDL, CKD, metabolic syndrome, uh, a number of maternal factors, inflammatory disease, ethnicity, a number of biomarkers, and coronary artery calcium scoring. And if you look across those, 
most of those factors carry an odds ratio of about two. They're thought to double your risk. And as I showed you looking way back at some of the earlier slides, being in that either top two and a half or fifth percentile of polygenic risk also seems to increase your odds of getting uh, incident ASCVD by about two. And so suggesting that maybe another role for this is not, you know, as the next item in the PCE score weighted in its own effect estimate, but rather as a, I've risk stratified you, and now you're sitting in my office and I'm trying to figure out what to do. And you're in this borderline to intermediate risk and I need something that's gonna push me one way or another. Another way I think that we can think about polygenic risk scores is the stratification of interventions. And so the idea that perhaps since we know that those at higher PRS have a higher absolute risk of disease, that targeting them for more intensive interventions may result in a greater risk reduction. And so this is some work, um, uh, one of two papers, this was published in JAMA Cardiology. There was another work um, by Amit Kara published in the New England Journal in which they looked at lifestyle factors, not medication, across bins of polygenic risk. And so what you see here is kind of this group at low genetic risk, intermediate genetic risk, and high genetic risk, and you clearly see evidence of an interaction. So those, you know, the reference group was those with low genetic risk and who had an ideal lifestyle. Even among those at with an ideal lifestyle, high genetic risk, they already carried a hazard of two for developing CVD. And you can see here, having a poor lifestyle and high genetic risk was much worse than having a poor lifestyle and low genetic risk. Now, this is a little bit of a straw man that I present because it comes with a nice graph. I don't think we would argue that, oh, you're of low genetic risk. It's okay. Go ahead and have a poor, healthy lifestyle, you're fine. I mean, this, this would actually suggest you're not fine, but it's this idea that we can stratify intervention. And so not surprisingly, people have looked across every major lipid trial that contained genetic information to show this also. And I'm showing data that Regeneron has generated and published in circulation in 2020 from, um, I always mess up my names, but I think this was the Odyssey Outcomes trial looking at alirocumab. But you can literally get the exact same figure from Fourier data uh, looking at evolucumab, or you can get the exact same figure comparing high intensity statins to low intensity statins. And in all of those cases, you can see that the effect of being on therapy, either PCSK9 inhibition or high intensity statin, is greater among those with high genetic risk than it is among those with low genetic risk, again, suggesting that there may be some ability to say, okay, we need to focus our effects or focus our treatments on that group. Now, I think those results are clearly due to this, which is that the absolute risk of disease, and these are looking at all of the different endpoints um, that was in that trial, are just more in the group at high polygenic risk. Um, and they're more at the group at high polygenic risk, even after you stratify them for other risk factor approaches. So whether or not you break them up to low LDL or high LDL, meet, you know, low Framingham or high Framingham, low P, LP little a or high LP little a, those at high polygenic risk are at higher risk of disease. So, I mean, it's kind of intuitive, right? If your absolute risk of disease is higher, the absolute effect of your intervention with the same relative risk will be greater. Um, but I think it does offer another way to think about using polygenic risk scores. And, and the final way that I think is really interesting to think about using polygenic risk scores, and there's been a couple of people that have looked at this, um, this is work from uh, Eric Topol's group, uh, is to motivate people. And so Eric's group has looked at this, Jason Vassy at the, um, at the Brigham and at the VA in, Philadelphia, in uh, Boston have looked at this. And it's built on this idea that people see genetics as deterministic. And if you give them genetic information, that that somehow is stronger 
than you just telling them we've added up your risk factors and think you're at risk for this disease. And so what this paper did, what the study did, was take individuals who had signed up for 23andMe and sent them an invitation to download an app that used their 23andMe data to calculate their polygenic risk score and then returned it to them with guidance. And they asked all kinds of questions, including kind of now that you know your genetic risk score, do you intend to make changes in your use of statins? And do you intend to actually go to the doctor and talk about this? And what you, they saw was that were those in the high CAD risk group were more likely to change how they use statins, which you know intuitively would be, I will either take more statins or I will actually take my statins that I was prescribed to begin with. Um, and we're more likely to discuss it with their doctors. And in fact, kind of they had these follow-up questionnaires, but this is one of those, like, there's not a great display item from the paper for me to show you to show this, but that they were actually, when they followed up with them later on, more likely to go talk to their doctors and were more likely to end up on high intensity statins. So I think this is encouraging that this may be, you know, these types of results may push people but we definitely need more implementation research. And in fact, Jason Vassy in Boston has just launched a huge Geno VA study to kind of look at how we can return these results to individuals and, and how we can employ this clinically. Um, switching gears a little bit, the other area that we see bandied around aside from polygenic risk in the kind of precision medicine literature is machine learning. And I think, you know, if you were to, pay attention to the internet and the lay press, you would think that kind of machine learning is essentially going to put us all out of our jobs as we develop artificial intelligence approaches to all of medical care. Um, this led my group in collaboration with some DOE investigators to try to ask, could we build a better mousetrap and could we improve risk prediction um, in the VA? And, and for this, again, similar to Peter's group, we used MVP data. We put together a slightly different study we took individuals who are free of hard CVD events. They could have some baseline CVD, but they just couldn't have had a hard event uh, when they enrolled um, and were not on a statin because we really wanted to model essentially a primary heart event prevention study in which the intervention would be putting someone on a statin. And what we did um, for a combined outcome of acute MI stroke and death and also individually for the outcomes, but I'm gonna show you the combined outcome data today, is look at how our ability to predict that was based on either traditional models using baseline data, so no time adjusted data. Um, if we threw kind of the kitchen sink of AI or artificial intelligence and machine learning models at this problem, kind of leveraging the fact that our Department of Energy colleagues were experts in this area, or if we threw additional genetic data at this, could we, could we beat the pooled cohorts equation? And so the first thing we did was to just use the phenotype data. And in fact, in this top panel, just use the variables in the pooled cohorts equation. And these are the AUCs and 95% confidence intervals around those. You'll see the pooled cohorts equation itself doesn't kind of get itself on this graph. It was down with an AUC of 0.58. But I would argue that that's not the right thing to pay attention to. So Peter and Jason had actually previously shown that if you recalibrate your pooled cohorts equation to a population that more closely represents your population rather than the 3,000 people that happen to be in the derivation cohorts for the pooled cohorts equation, that it does a lot better. And so this Cox model is essentially taking the pooled cohorts equation, turning it into a Cox proportional hazard model and modeling it in our training data in the VA. So this is kind of a veteran specific pooled cohorts. And what you see is kind of, across a range of AI or machine learning models, you, you don't beat that. That traditional regression models are pretty good when you're talking about five or six risk factors. What we then did is expand the feature space. So rather than say you get the you know, risk factors in the pooled cohorts equation, we broadly extracted essentially every prevalent disease that we could, as well as every baseline laboratory value we could extract, including measures of whether it was measured in the first place or not. And so had this huge multi uh, 
risk factor data set with like close to a thousand risk factors. And when we use that, we really start to see some improvement. In fact, you don't see the Cox model on here anymore because it failed to converge. It actually couldn't deal with the data. Probably the best comparator is this logistic regression model. And we really, we really moved past that and pushing the AUC up into the uh, 0.75 range. So getting a really, really good model. Um, if you look here, comparing you know, what was the uncalibrated PCE risk in a, AU, in a receiver operating curve to that of the Cox model, to that of our ensemble expanded model, which was really the best machine learning model, you see consistent improvements. And then when you start to ask, how much does our risk model capture the population that's actually at risk and you compare it to the PCE, what you see is that if you followed the top 25% of the population, which you think is at risk based on the model, the PCEs get you 40% of the people that actually have disease or will go on to have disease. Whereas our expanded model gets you 60% of the people that actually go on to have an event fall within the top 25% of risks. So this is a way to kind of look across tests and see what one is doing better. Um, people argue that AI is not explainable, that you get a model, you don't know what it means. I would argue that that's not true. What you can see here are SHAP values, which kind of are this combination of variable importance and effect estimate. And you can see, and I think this is exactly what you would think, that higher age is an increasing risk value, is an increasing risk. Being on a blood pressure medication it increases your risk. Um, blue is the lower value of the variable. Red is the higher value of the variable. You might be concerned here that a lower value of smoking would um, is associated with increased risk. And that got us very concerned until we realized like a little quirk of the system, which is we told the computer that people were either current, former, or never smokers. And the way the computer assigns those variables is the highest level went to the one that was alphabetically first. And so while intuitively being a never smoker would be a zero, it somehow turned being a never smoker into being a three. And so never smoking was protected, which was once we figured that out, much more reassuring. Um, not only can you actually demonstrate at a population level with the approach, you, this approach, you can actually demonstrate at an individual level with this approach. And so you can see here for this random individual, the age is increasing their risk, they're at a relatively low risk. And these are the kind of combinations of things we did throw in CAD, and you know, this is probably a bad example of an individual to show because this is actually someone in which their CAD polygenic risk score was influential, but this shows kind of in order the factors that were most inferential, influential in reducing their risk. So the fact that they had a relatively mac low maximum glucose, that they were on a blood pressure med, that they had a low white blood cell count, uh, or actually it was 5.9 at enrollment, um, that their systolic was 132, that they were a former smoker, uh, you know, and so forth up to kind of these are the top factors for this person, which aren't necessarily the top factors for someone else. And so this is really the neat thing about machine learning models is what is important for you doesn't have to be important for someone else. And it can model these really complex interactions. Because we're geneticists, we couldn't resist throwing in a polygenic risk score. Um, we actually looked at it both as a composite score. And in fact, we used two polygenic risk scores together, the polygenic risk score for stroke and the polygenic risk score for MI or CAD, I should say, because we were modeling a composite outcome of heart events, which includes both of those. We included it both as a composite PRS, which I'm showing here. And in other experiments, we literally just included all of the DNA variants in any of those scores, thinking that the machine learning would kind of handle complex uh, combinations of those. And, and we see no improvement. I mean, you, you can't like, if we didn't color them, you wouldn't know that there were two receiver operator curves here. And so while for that one individual I showed you, it seemed like there was some improvement in score, I think at the population level, at least in our data, the PRS isn't adding, isn't adding much. So that's a pretty, I think at the end of the day for the CAD PRS, at least in terms of predicting disease, a less than enthusiastic story. I think I showed you a few areas where there may be some utility in CAD. 
But I don't think that that means we need to be like totally bearish on, on polygenic risk. And so as a vascular surgeon, one of the things I think about is AAA. Um, and currently we screen, it depends on what guidelines you wanna follow, but we at minimum screen men who are 65 or older with a history of smoking or family history, depending on whose guidelines you wanna follow, we do or do not screen women. Um, but we, and, and, and so we wanted to know, following on a lot of work we've done on the genetics of AAA, could we improve upon this with a polygenic risk score? So we used some summary statistics from a large GWAS we did. We developed and, and kind of tuned up a score to make it perform as best as we could. Our score was a rather simple one with just 29 DNA variants associated with really only a modest increase in AAA risk. Um, that increase in AAA risk persisted even after we controlled for smoking and family history of having a AAA. So again, getting at the idea that this was uh, independent of traditional risk factors. And then when we took it to external cohorts for validation, saw that it remained robust and that a high polygenic risk was in fact associated with having a AAA. Now, how that plays into risk prediction for AAA is that I told you our current guidelines suggest that we should uh, screen men age 65 to 75 who are ever a smoker. And this is based on kind of outcome and cost effectiveness data suggesting that if your population has a prevalence of six to 7% for AAA, this intervention or the screening intervention makes sense and is worth it. Um, and so when we look across different populations, what we see is if you incorporate a PRS that at least in indiv white individuals or individuals of European genetic ancestry, the top 5% of PRS across all ages and sexes have about a 5.9% prevalence of AAA, and that at least men over 50 in the top 5% of PRS have a prevalence of about 86 of AAA. So suggesting that if we incorporated genetics into the screening of AAA to identify who to screen, we'd increase the pool of individuals eligible and we'd pick up more aneurysms. Uh, in some unpublished work, we've also started to apply the same approach to thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections. So we did a very large GWAS of thoracic aortic disease for which those of you that treat uh, or follow patients with TAA uh, and dissections know there's no screen, you know, no good risk prediction tool for screening. There's no universal screening guidelines other than if a family member had the disease, it's recommended you get an echo at some point. We really don't do anything beyond that. So we developed a polygenic risk score based on our GWAS. It had a strong association for being in the top 5% with having an aneurysm or a dissection with an odds ratio of, uh, well, you know, above two. And in fact, using incident data in the UK biobank, it was associated with having an incident thoracic aortic aneurysm dissection or having aneurysm related death with an odds ratio above two and for death close to four. So again, suggesting for these diseases that we don't have good clinical risk prediction scores for, the genetics really may be of utility. Um, and that I think gets us to where I think that precision medicine is moving or where we're going with risk prediction, which is population specific models using expanded feature sets and machine learning. We can clearly explain it. The health infra care IT infrastructure to implement these things exists. And I think, again, this is probably where the improvements are gonna come. And then I think there is you know, a use for polygenic risk scores as I hopefully have showed you. Um, and, and, and those are the following. Now, the first one is one that I didn't mention, but I think also is a little bit intuitive, which is as we, unleash genetics and healthcare systems, we're gonna have people have polygenic risk scores, but don't have all of their risk factors measured. And so that's an obvious group, right? We're not calculating their risk right now. We're gonna have information on the shelf we can use to calculate their risk. But then additionally, in borderline and intermediate risk individuals as part of genomic population health initiatives, and then for vascular disease without strong existing risk models. Um, I now wanna pivot for the last few minutes to another approach to where I think precision medicine is going, which is precision atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease therapy. So this is how we treat 
all of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease now. We target the traditional risk factors, either with lifestyle medications or lifestyle modifications or medication. And we do it in a way that is like pretty blanket, whether or not you have CAD, PAD, or cerebrovascular disease, and we treat them all the same. Um, we're certainly trying to push the envelope with new medications, and we're pushing the envelope with new medications that cost a lot of money, right? So like we had, uh, you know, at, at um, AHA this year, we had results from Amgen's old Parisian trial. That's not going to be an inexpensive drug. If you look at kind of what the other therapies that have been advanced lipid therapies have come out as. So like we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for targeting APOC3 or ANGPTL3, um, you know, tens of thousands of years up to $100,000 a year for some of the therapies that are targeting inflammation. Obviously, none of these have kind of clinically been deployed in large populations, but, you know, where the field is moving is new efficacious therapies that cost a lot of money. So perhaps we need something beyond a one size fits all approach, both to improve disease management, but also to you know, not bankrupt the entire country on advanced lipid therapies. And so I would argue this is not what the landscape should look like, but that is what the landscape that should look like, that these are actually three different diseases. So we've done some work to try to get at this using Mendelian randomization. This is a genetic technique that allows you to look at the causal effects of non-genetic risk factors on non-genetic outcomes. And it essentially mimics a randomized controlled trial in which rather than randomizing people to a modifier or a drug and a placebo, you're essentially randomizing them to having increased genetic propensity or increased genetic propensity or decreased genetic propensity towards the exposure based on the fact that our genetic material is randomly assorted prior to birth and so isn't affected by environmental effects. And I, I will spare you the math, but kind of accepting a number of uh, kind of requirements for the kind of how these different things fit together. You can do some relatively simple division and end up with uh, effect estimates that we like to say are causal, assuming you've met these kind of variable, uh, instrumental variable assumptions. And so we applied this method across a whole range of traditional risk factors, um, comparing their effect on PAD and their effect on coronary heart disease. And this is kind of the results from probably four or five papers that Mike has had in this time with me. And what we see, and I think this is not super surprising because there's epidemiologic data to suggest this, that diabetes and smoking have a greater effect on PAD whereas LDL cholesterol and diastolic blood pressure have a greater, and, and systolic blood pressure have a greater effect on CHD. And that kind of this would suggest targeting one over the other kind of with specific interventions might make sense. Now, again, with the traditional risk factors, I'm never gonna not put my PAD patient on a statin because truthfully, I actually think statins are good for PAD and I'd like to prevent their heart attack, which I know they're at risk for. And I'm never gonna tell my patient with CHD you know, it's okay if you keep smoking and we're going to leave your diabetes untreated. But I think this suggests that these aren't the same diseases. Where we do get into things that I think are implementable is when we use these approaches to probe biology. And so this is a, a really complicated Mendelian randomization experiment that uses some Bayesian statistics to account for the fact that all of the lipids are super correlated. And so, you know, when you try to do multiple regression with correlated exposures, the whole thing falls apart and it's really hard to untangle. And so we use this, some advanced um, MR approaches, collaborating with folks at the University of Cambridge and looked at the kind of the composite list of LDL, ApoB, triglycerides, HDL, and ApoA, and identified that both for PAD and CAD, the causal lipoprotein is, is almost certainly ApoB, containing particles and not these other species. Other people have showed this as well. What's really interesting is we then tried to ask, what is the ApoB containing particle that causes PAD and CAD? And now we start to get different results. And so we see for PAD that the most likely causal particle is extra small VLDL, whereas for CAD, the most likely causal particle is large LDL. I think suggesting, and again, 
confirming a body of literature and a body of observational literature that triglyceride rich lipoproteins um, and cholesterol remnants may be more important for peripheral artery disease than for coronary disease and that straight up LDL cholesterol particles may be more important for coronary disease. And again, this is probably the most detailed mechanistic we're able to get with humans. Now we then use the genetics of those two species to try to ask what are the genes associated with one over the other and what could potential new targets for therapy be that would preferentially affect either extra small VLDL or large LDL and in turn either PAD or CAD, and you start to see some interesting things. So like NLRC5, APOA5, and PTL3 are all you know, more associated with extra small VLDL, suggesting maybe we want to focus there on PAD, whereas things like PCSK9 look like they may be slightly more associated with large LDL, perhaps in having an outsized role in the management of CAD. And so when you take that kind of data and then start to combine it with this list of therapies, you could potentially start to think about, and you know, I didn't show you data on inflammation, but you know, where can we deploy some of these therapies thinking about these diseases as different diseases rather than just, oh, you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you're gonna get put on aspirin, statin, and some other stuff that depends on some elusive factors, including what your insurance will cover. Now. I think there's another level you can think of precision cardiovascular disease at, and this is starting to move towards a cancer model, which, okay, it's not the, you know, CAD, PAD, cerebrovascular disease, but it's all of this is different. And you can have two patients with coronary artery disease and the underlying biology could be very different. This suggests one therapy over another. Um, you know, if we take the cancer analogy, we don't treat all non-small cell lung cancer the same. We go and get tissue. We look at surface expression of receptors on the tissue. We sequence the tissue at a, at a huge depth. We identify specific somatic variants in the tumor. And then we use one of a host of many, many drugs to specifically target that. And so can we move towards that for cardiovascular disease? And this is not... Um, necessarily based on any of my work, but is based on some work of Andrew Buckler, who was a doctoral thesis candidate at the Karolinska Institute and comes out of some of the work that they're doing. Um, I was lucky enough to get to go over and participate in his uh, thesis, but, but he's trying to put forward an approach in which you non-invasively characterize the plaque, because we're not going to go and biopsy someone's coronary artery to know what kind of drug to put them on. Um, you then use that to predict gene expression, pathway analysis, stress and strain of the plaque. You build systems biology models and you model perturbing that system with different drugs. And from that, you come up with an individual level uh, uh, therapeutic recommendation. I think we're a long way off from this, but I think when we talk about precision cardiovascular medicine, some version of this in which we're able to look at the patient in front of us and target their biology versus just average biology is probably what we really mean when we say precision medicine and probably what we should be striving for. Um, and so I think the future of precision medicine for therapeutic selection is um, disease specific paradigms for risk factor management. It is disease specific par par paradigms for pharmacologic management. I would argue that we are, if not there, we are almost there. We've seen in the past few years, the incorporation of, not, of specific pre-specified non-coronary endpoints in major lipid drug trials and in other trials. And I think we need to encourage more of this to try to understand where these emerging therapeutics might have a role. And then ultimately, you know, I think there's this goal to be aspired to, to some form of non-invasive assessment of patient-specific biology to inform risk and therapy. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, conclude and I'm happy to take any questions. Are we gonna have some uh, things on the chat or 
questions coming in for our class. Let's see here. You'd think this many years. Oh, okay. Got it. So this many Scott, years into Zoom, I should be able to use no, chat. So Scott, thanks very much. Uh, one of the questions I know you have some data on, you didn't talk too much about, is a peripheral vascular disease and clotting factors and other things, uh, and partly why they're different. That refers to some of what you were talking about at the end there. So tell us your latest thoughts about how and why the, the yeah. person with PAD is different from the person with coronary disease. And that's right up your alley. That's yeah, right. so let me, let me, let me. So, you know, it, Peter, I included this slide because it was easy because I had already annotated it, but I'm gonna use it to, to answer your question. I gotta just get back to it as one of the, this slide here. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn on screen share again. So this is the, um, This is actually the results of our GWAS for uh, peripheral artery disease. This is about 35,000 individuals in a combination of the VA Million Veteran Program and the UK Biobank. And right here is factor five. And this was a really interesting finding. Um, and it's kind of, you know, when you get this, you kind of stand up and scream jackpot when you're doing genetic epidemiology, because the hardest trick in genetic epidemiology is figuring out what these peak roots represent. So these, you know, the way to think about this graph is this is the negative log 10 P value. So this is the significance. And then these, you know, each dot is a DNA variant arranged in their order along the genome. And basically the spike is where there is a signal where there a section of the genome associates with your disease of interest. And so 9P21 is this canonical cardiovascular disease uh, risk locus that hundreds of research of groups have spent more than a decade. I mean, we've known about this since our first GWAS, trying to figure out what the biology is there. It's, it's not clear that we know. Some people think they know, others disagree with them. And so trying to go from a spike to a, a mechanism is really challenging. This was a jackpot finding because this top dot here, the lead variant is actually the factor five Leiden variant. And so we know how that works. That's a coding variant in factor five that affects the clotting cascade. It's the lead risk factor, at least in a GWAS for VTE. It increases your risk of VTE by about twofold. And so to me, this suggests that there's a significant role of hemostasis and thrombosis in PAD. And we went and looked across at the time, all of the genetic data we could put together. So I think this was close to 300,000 individuals with CAD. So all of the MVP data, all of the UK Biobank data and all of the cardiogram plus C4D data. And there was no association of factor five Leiden with CAD whatsoever. And then um, Adam Sucker, a he hematologist at Penn, has gone out and meta-analyzed all of the stroke literature and does see an association with stroke. So to me, at least for PAD, I haven't thought about the stroke results as much. It suggests that there's kind of a different role of thrombosis in PAD. You know, in PAD, we see people with really long segment stenoses where, you know, you can imagine you're getting stagnation of blood upstream of that and where hemostasis in general and thrombosis and slight disorders in that may push you towards thrombosis in the vessel. Whereas in CAD, most of our thrombosis comes from rupture of plaque and exposure of tissue factor, where you can imagine that, you know, you don't need any deficiencies in, in your coagulation cascade to have tissue factor lead to a thrombosis um, because that's what kind of our tissue, our, our cascade is designed to do. Okay. Yep. Okay. The data is more important in younger people. Do you know if they have the generator? Okay. So I can break that down into, you know, yes in men, no in women. Um, you know, some of that could be due to event rates, certainly, right? I mean, all of these sample sizes, particularly in younger women, are going to be lower event rates. And so some may be related to that. Um, beyond that, I don't have a great explanation why we're seeing a sex difference. Um, and then, you know, in terms of all of us, uh, I don't know what their plans are 
with respect to returning polygenic risk scores. I know that FinGen has some work in which they've started returning it. There's been talk in MVP about how to return it. Jason Vassy has led one of the return of results projects and done some really nice work around that. But I don't know what, what the plans for all of us are. Why not compare PAD, PRS to CAC and pull it as a weight? I, I think that's a great idea, um, comparing PRS to CAC and PRS plus CAC. Um, I, I personally don't have a data set in which I can do that. You know, a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the work that Peter's done has been in the VA Million Veterans Program. And, you know, the way that data works is it's veterans who get care at the VA come and sign up for the study. We get a blood sample, which we link to their EHR. We generate genetics off of their blood sample. And so all of our phenotype information for that research comes from their electronic health record. And so we're limited by kind of the low clinical utilization of CAC within the VA. Um, it's certainly something that could be done in some of the prospective NHLBI cohorts that have CAC measurements and have polygenic risk scores and incident data. Um, I think that's a great question for them. Uh, I don't happen to be affiliated with any of them, so personally couldn't investigate it. But I think trying to sort these things out will be important. Although, you know, I would argue that, again, the answer is probably not just putting both of these things in the polygenic risk score. And I think you could say, okay, fine, well, CAC's a pretty good risk enhancer. Even if a PRS is just as good, why would you use that? And I think the answer to that question is, pretty soon we're just going to have that data. The rate at which healthcare systems are generating genetic data on their patients is really expanding. And so you can imagine a very near future where I could send my patient to go get CAC measured, or I could literally just look up in the computer what their polygenic risk score is. And so I think that some of what we're going to be kind of struggling with is this data is going to be there. And then we're going to need to figure out how to use it. Not, you know, are we going to go generate this data to inform patient care? It's really, you know, this is what we're going to have. Patients are going to ask us about it and we're going to have to figure out how to use it. Oh, this is terrific. I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, you're talking a lot about patients, but uh, in society, we do a lot of things. The Heart Association has told us to do for all these years. We don't really do most of them, but we all know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to eat right. We're supposed to exercise. We're supposed to not smoke, blah, blah, blah. But uh, what uh, if, if we really do prevention, we, we don't do it in patients. We do it in people who are not patients yet. And uh, well, as we see a long, I'm, I'm talking about prevention of atherosclerosis, not prevention of events. If we really suppress atherosclerosis, we got to do it before they get it, right? I mean, that's uh, a place to do it, which implies that something that is there your whole lifetime, you don't have to wait till you're hypertensive. You don't have to wait till you've got diabetes or wait till you're obese, et cetera, that these things uh, uh, being these polygenic uh, scores, uh, what, what do you perceive as uh, when these become available to everybody? Right. So, uh, how do you perceive these having an effect over and above the knowledge of everybody that to my father, my grandfather, yeah. everybody had a heart attack, so I'm worried about them uh, versus people who say, uh, nobody in my family had that yeah. stuff, so I don't worry about it. What are these rational decisions actually uh, based on your polygenic right. risk score? So, so you've essentially just described the NHGRI Emerge 4 study. And so Emerge is this large number of academic biobanks and institutions that are collaborating around the use of genetics. And what they're really focusing on is identifying, I think, four or five different polygenic risk scores, and this includes pediatric hospitals, and then trying to implement them in clinical practice. And I think what you're driving at, right, is like if we can figure out that you have increased CAD at birth, we can start prevention early and prevent not even an event, but prevent atherosclerosis. And in that, again, so one of the famous examples from Emerge 4 was BMI. But then that got, because we're really good at predicting BMI with PRS. It's, it's a quantitative trait. The genetics of BRI or BMI are really well known. The problem becomes, okay, great. I know a two-year-old's BMI PRS, and I know they're at high risk. 
I'm going to tell them to exercise, but I'm going to tell all the two-year-olds to exercise. I'm going to tell them to eat healthy, but I'm telling all the two-year-olds to eat healthy. I'm not certainly not going to tell the two-year-old that is at low BMI risk that they should go, you know, eat not healthy. And so it becomes this question of when most of your modifications are lifestyle, knowing it earlier, are we going to not provide, you know, we're providing everyone with the same lifestyle modification advice because we think everyone needs to do it. Where I think it does offer the opportunity is maybe not at that youngest age, but maybe at a slightly older age, right? If you knew someone was at extremely high polygenic risk or extremely high risk, no matter how you could calculate it, in their 20s for CAD, you might think about starting a statin way earlier than you otherwise would before they manifest increased lipid levels. Um, and, and so I think there is some opportunity for this very early identification before someone has the risk factor to try to prevent the risk factor. The other way, and I was getting at a little bit of this with Eric Topol's work, um, but again, the folks at FinGen have done it. Jason has, has kind of talked about doing it in the setting of the VA. In, they've done some patient surveys in the VA is the degree to which individual patients is like my way of cheating healthcare consumers, you know, the general population views genetics versus this generic elusive, well, there's some CAD in my family. Well, no, someone looked at my genetic risk and I'm at increased genetic risk. It does seem that that speaks to people. And so some of the role of this in the general population, if you will, the pre-cardiology patient population may be less as a, well, because you're at high polygenic risk, we're going to tell you to eat healthy. But as a, when you're thinking about those decisions, you know, you're objectively at high risk and therefore you may adhere to the healthier lifestyle guidance. And I think that we've seen evidence of that, but there's a lot more to do with implementation. Early starting a statins probably has more differentiation than say eat healthier. I mean, I, I can, t I can tell you that, you know, I, I've had this exact discussion with, with people in my research group who have family history of, of, of MI at an early age who are in their thirties and they're trying to decide whether or not they should start a statin with ostensibly normal lipid profiles. And, you know, some of them that are more up on the literature have, and others haven't, but you know, it's a great, you know, we, we bandied around to implement this at Penn or think about how to implement that. Is that an eerily po easy population to start with, right? Strong family history, strong risk, don't have elevated lipids yourself, but should we start them because of your likely increased risk? One more quick question from Dr. Smith on the, on the line. Dr. Smith? Yeah, just a question. A lot of patients don't take statins because of perceived intolerances, or they actually have intolerance. They may be slow metabolizers. Could you comment on the use of genetic testing uh, in advance of starting a therapy to prevent to, to predict intolerance? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's an ongoing area of research. There's certainly pharmacogenomics that suggests that you may or may not have statin intolerance. Um, there's a large MVP project trying to look at kind of the genetics of statin intolerance. You know, I, I think the trick there is not just finding the genetics that associate, and this is really the trick with all of it, but figuring out where the implementation science takes us in terms of what makes sense. It may be that we can predict statin intolerance really well, and it may be that there's no element of that that is cost effective because putting someone on a statin is the ultimate decider of whether or not they're going to have statin intolerance. And you know what? If they're intolerant, we stop it and we put them on something else. And, you know, that may be the ultimate way. So I think that we'll get there. We'll definitely get there with the genetics, but whether or not that'll be the way we figure it out or we figure it out by continuing just to start people on statins, I think is up in the air. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Dan Rauer, and thank you all for listening. Take care. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.